So now we're taking a look at this one here. This is the MC2200. And you said it's making a weird noise. There's some AC with it. So probably the capacitors yeah. are shot. If it even comes on anymore. Oh yeah. I hear it. Well, we don't need to do that anymore. We can pull it Pretty right happy. out of there right now if you want. Sure. Jeez. Hey everyone, in today's video, we've got an absolutely massive Macintosh MC2200 power amplifier. You may have heard it in the video, but when my neighbor turned this on, an AC hum started coming out of his speakers. So that's why it's on the bench today. We're gonna figure out why it's got that hum and we're gonna get it fixed. This thing is insanely heavy and it is insanely powerful. Let's take a look at it. I don't even need to tell you how much power it has. I can just show you because it says right on it. 200 watts in stereo, 400 watts in mono. This is a pretty serious piece of equipment here. The story is my neighbor used to run a sound company in the 70s and he had one of these to run the big speakers. Then you've got two absolutely enormous filter capacitors and behind each one of these is four TO3 transistors. So that's eight transistors per side. To put that into perspective, most amplifiers only have two. And this Marantz 240 we all think to be really big and powerful, it only has four per side. So this thing is basically double the power, double the size. Yeah, like I said, massive filter capacitors. You've got connections for, depending on the impedance of your speaker, you can pick which one on there, kind of like a tube amp. And over here we've got, I noticed this, a 10 amp fuse. I think most receivers I have on this bench, they only have like a two amp or maybe even a three amp. So that's huge. Then we've got uh, some little switches here and then you got an input. Pretty simple, but very big. And the simplicity continues up front. You've got a left gain, a right gain, or mono gain if you want to run it in mono, and then a power switch. The uh, logo right here, it's a little loose, so we'll fix that also. And then you've got normal lights and limit lights. Oh, and how could I forget? You've got a headphone jack for your 200 watt per channel amplifier. I say we get this thing powered up. We'll see if it's doing the same thing on my speakers and then we'll start tearing it into it and see what's wrong. So I forgot to hit record the first time, but I wanted to see what happens when you put this on the dim bulb. I was thinking it would be drawing a lot of current since it's such a big amp, I thought it'd have a high idle current, but when you turn it on, I just got a little flash and nothing else. But you know, I hear a relay click in, there's like nothing on that bulb, which is really interesting. You know, Marantz 2270, it's gonna keep the bulb kind of lit up when it's running, so I don't know. Now let's check the speaker outputs for AC and DC. We know we heard that AC earlier. It will be interesting to see if we see it on our voltmeter. We're going to check DC first. Let's start with the left channel. I think COM is probably ground. We have nothing DC. Excellent. And then let's check our right channel. Nothing DC. That's that's really quite nice. All right, let's go to that AC now. So on the right channel, we have oh yeah, that's half a volt AC on the right channel. That's that's not good. And you can see it uh, changes with the uh, the different uh, impedance selections you have here. And yeah, it's similar situation on the uh, left channel as well. Yeah, let's see if we can hear it. Yeah. So there it is. Very interesting. And over here, same thing. So that's not right. We need to figure out where that's coming from. I am going to start taking this apart. Holy moly. So far I don't see anything obvious. I see we've got our massive relay back here. The contacts look nice. They don't look like they've gotten hot or anything. 
the uh, filter capacitors, they're the uh, screw-in type. So you got your ground bus bar right there, and then you've got uh, probably the positive, and maybe that one's the negative since it's got the brown wires on it. Then you've got the bottoms of your output transistor arrays. Then it looks like you've got little pre-driver boards for each side. And they have connectors on them, which is great, because what that means is it's going to be a lot easier to troubleshoot things. You can easily disconnect a board and see if your issue goes away. So, I still don't see the power supply board. I'm going to look for that a little bit further, because I have a feeling the issue is going to be in the power supply, since we have the same issue on both sides. Well, that was easy. Let me show you. I'll put it on there. I removed one leg. In circuit slash short. Folks, that is not in circuit. We have a bad cap. So, let's get that replaced. We'll replace the other one too. Even though it tests with capacitance, this is still a 2200 microfarad capacitor. It's measuring at 3200, so that means something's very wrong. Let's get these replaced immediately and see what happens. There's just one small issue. This is the only one I have. I only have one 2200 microfarad capacitor. Let's just replace the one we know to be awful and uh, throw it back in and see if that works because it really doesn't take anything to take this thing in and out. So I think I'm okay to turn this on here. We're still on the dim bulb. I haven't removed anything except the cover down there, so it should be okay. And there, we get that. We get the relay click. So now, let's check in the back and see if that AC voltage is still there. We got about 0.4 volts at uh, the 8 ohm line. Okay, so it's still there. It would have been cool if we got lucky, but you know, that's generally not how this works. So let's just try another thing real quick. If we look at these boards, we've got you know a pre-driver for each set of outputs. These wires all go right into here. So I'm thinking that this is gonna be you know your signal out for this driver board before it goes into the big, big power transistors. So if we unplug this, it should, in theory, isolate the, uh, the AC if it's happening here. If it's happening in there, it's likely related to the filter capacitors because the filter capacitors, they're basically responsible for these things working. So I'll start with both being unplugged and I'll add them back one at a time if there's anything different happening on this end. So we'll get the dim bulb turned back on. I'll zoom out for you. Let's turn this thing on. Normal. So now we should have nothing entering the power amplifier, essentially. So let's see now what we have going here. Okay, so that's a much smaller number on that amplifier. And this is a much bigger number on this amplifier. So that's very interesting. I just took all the leads off of that filter capacitor and this thing said it's an open circuit. So I was like, huh, let's turn this on, which it is right now, and let's check the voltage. It's supposed to be 42 volts DC. Uh-oh, 26 volts DC. That's extremely wrong. And uh, the other one has the 42, but its capacitance measured at like 50,000 microfarad on this. So I think it might be time for new filter capacitors on this power amplifier. That's gonna be a good thing. I mean, you want that to be a reliable, fresh component on something of this scale. And the reason I went back to check these, which I should have done in the first place, is I was looking at the power supply and it actually, this thing actually gets its DC to do things with from those filter capacitors. So 
Uh, that's a little bit different than uh, the receivers I'm used to working on, but you know, this is a very different beast, obviously. I'm gonna try something kind of stupid real quick here. I happen to have this capacitor waiting to go in that Marantz 240. It's 22,000 microfarads, so it's not the 3900, but it's gonna be enough to uh, just do this quick little idling test here. So I wanna see what the voltage is at this capacitor on the negative side when we uh, put some power to it. So let's see what happens when we charge it up. We get a relay click. Let's see what we get on this here capacitor. We get 39 volts, which is exactly what we want to see. And remember, this is in parallel with the old one right now. So I'll bet you we probably don't get that AC at the speaker terminals anymore. So let's check for that real quick. Switch it to AC. Nothing AC. And nothing AC. That's it. That's the problem. Failed filter capacitor. All right, let's get some on order. Well, would you looky here? We've got parts, nice big parts, and it's gonna be really, really easy to replace these because all that happens is they just screw in to the chassis of the receiver. And we're gonna have more interruptions with noise. Here's the old one. It's basically uh, the exact same as the new one. And the only difference really I, that I see is this is a flathead. Let's go in through the other side here. And let's feed this through. Might need to reuse this old screw, actually, if the threads are the same. So yeah, it's official. I am reusing the old screw. Because it is the same thread. Okay, got the first one done. Now let's get the second one. What I actually did for that one is I just kind of unscrewed the stack up here and removed the old capacitor, but then I kept my screwdriver on here. And then the stack up was all set up and I just kind of fished the new capacitor around the back and that allowed me to get it on really easily. So now I think we can turn it on and see if it explodes or not. Put it on the dim bulb just in case. Okay, now that the power supply board is plugged back in, let's see if we get anything out of the relay. Oh no. Why is this happening? Holy sh! I don't know what that was all about. Okay. That's better. So I think what just happened there is I did not have that power supply board seated properly in the connector that you don't see in this view. And when I poked it to move it, um, there was a short of some sorts that didn't seem to damage anything. Let's see, maybe now's a good time to try out some speakers. Let's see how this dang thing works. Okay, speakers are hooked up. And everyone's favorite song is playing. Let's see what happens. Right side works. And left side works. Controls are plenty dirty. But it sounds very good. So many of you get so mad at me in the comments for not having this be the very first thing I do when I work on something. And you're right. I'm going to give it to you. I should have done this first thing, but I want to show you something. I just recently got this. A deal came up. I could not refuse it. So what I was working with before was just a crappy little pancake compressor that would just, you know, run constantly. 
and I always hated, you know, running it because it was so freaking noisy. And I would always drain the air out of that at the end like you're supposed to, so I'd have to wait for it to come back up and, you know, just a pain in the butt. But this thing, I leave the air in it and drain it every once in a while. This is, this is wonderful. All the air you could ever need to, you know, blow out a dusty amplifier. What's left on this thing? Well, it's time to recap it. There's really not that much to do. Uh, we have this board, which has some pretty easy to get to capacitors. You can see I've already replaced these two. And I'll say, yes, there's Nichicon KAs in here. I did that because I accidentally ordered those instead of Nichicon PWs. I would have put PWs here because they're power for the lamps or something, but I was not thinking when I ordered parts. And we've got three more right here. I'll replace those and that'll be done. Let me flip over to the bottom side now. Under here we've got like a driver assembly for each channel. One up here and one down here. They are the same. And they each have four electrolytic capacitors on them. So all four of those on each board will be replaced. It looks like it's really easy to remove it. Everything connects to it with a connector, like a non-solder connection. And there's just three nuts to get it off of the uh, chassis. So that should be super easy. But the only tedious thing here is going to be back in here. This is the input. This is where you plug in your RCA cables for the input. And the very first capacitor that the signal passes through is right here for each channel. So I want to replace those. I might have to remove this heat sink here to get better access, but I'll try it without doing that, of course, because that's how I roll. It's not how you should roll, but it's how I roll. So. I think I'm just going to cue the time lapse because this is very rudimentary stuff. I'm just replacing capacitors. So let's go. Some of you may have noticed it. I thought I was finished, but then I realized this capacitor was shorting all over this leg of that switch, so I had to add some uh, insulator back to it. But now it looks like we've got these old capacitors replaced. Cleaning the controls on this amp is super easy because you got one pot, two pot, and they're very easy to get to. So we'll just take our Deoxit Fader F5, we'll squirt it through that little slot there. And we'll just exercise it a little bit, and that's going to be a cleaned control. Who wants to see a cat dance? Yeah, that's one thing that's very interesting about her. She doesn't really mind dancing too much. It's kind of funny. Alright, she's getting a little tense now. Okay, I'll let you down. So I'm going to very crudely set the bias on this thing. I have this little meter right here called the kilowatt. I'm not going to be able to clearly show this in the camera since, you know, my setup is kind of like this. Um, but basically what the service manual says is you've got your adjustment pot right there, those little blue guys. You're going to turn those both counterclockwise, see what that wattage is, and then you're going to turn each one up until the wattage increases by 6 watts. So that's what I'm about to do. So now I just turned that down all the way. Now I'm going to turn this one down all the way. That says about 19.5 watts. So we're going to turn this until we see 25.5 watts. Okay, we'll put it right there. 
25.5. And now we're going to get 31.5 by adjusting the other one. I think we can call this good. I guess I'll go back to testing and playing some music and see if it runs really hot or something. Because it should be fine. Yeah, not so fast, huh? So, I noticed that these normal and limit lights did not work. So I was like, huh, what's going on with that? Let me show you the schematic. So basically it's very simple. You've got, you know, negative 12 in for each lamp for normal. Then you've got this little transistor array. I'm assuming that if something happens, it'll turn off the normal and turn on the limit. And then it just goes to each of the four lamps and a ground. So, you know, this is not a complicated circuit. You've also got like an AC in at the bottom there. So I was like, okay. Let's figure this out. Shouldn't be too bad. If you recall, one of these capacitors was completely leaky, shorted in the uh, beginning of the video. So I was like, okay, maybe that's why it wasn't working. Um, well, I replaced it and it still wasn't working. I was trying to figure out if the negative 12 volts was getting there, and it was not. So I went to these amp boards, and there's a negative 12 volts out for the limit lamp, and it was not there. So I was like, okay, I'll go back here. And when I pulled this board out, this capacitor right here was warm to the touch. And that was a big red flag for me. But let me take a step back even further. And I don't know if this happened before my oops or after. But right here, this PCB trace was just open. Like, power to that capacitor just wasn't getting to it. And I thought that was kind of weird. You would think maybe the trace failed, but if you look really closely, I mean, underneath there is foil. And it's not in the schematic. There is not a fusible link in the schematic right there. But if you look up here, why is that exposed and nothing else is? If you look even closer, there's like little indentations in it. I think that's a fusible link. Because, if you look at the back of this thing, this fuse is rated at 10 amps. 10 amp fuse, so it's going to take a lot to blow that. Something's going to go wrong in here to blow that, but what if something goes wrong in here? You know, something that's much smaller. It's not going to take out that 10 amp fuse, so it makes a lot of sense to have little tiny fusible links on here in case something goes bad. And that might be what happened. So I replaced it with this one amp fuse right here. I got it off some random board of something at work. Thanks Bill. And I think that's going to be okay. I haven't tested it yet. But anyways, let me get back to this capacitor being warm here. So when I felt this was warm I was like, okay, the issue's on this board. Let's figure it out. And I could have sworn I checked these little diodes in between these caps before. But as you can see, one of them is not like the others. That red band one is original, and the silver band one is new. So let me show you the original diode. Yeah, I think that's going to come through. That's a cracked case. So this is actually a shorted diode. So I replaced that with a 1N4007 because Macintosh is douchebags, and they don't give you the actual part numbers, they give you a Macintosh part number. But, you know, you can kind of go off of, like, the size and, like, people online have ideas in the forums. So, 1M4007 seemed just fine for whatever that was. And once I replaced that diode, the lamps worked. So, that concludes the rebuilding of this thing. Let me get this back together. I want to see if we can do a power test on it. I'm not sure my little scope is going to be able to measure it, but I'm curious. So let's take a look. All right, we've got the whole setup here. We've got the frequency generator generating about a kilohertz. We've got the oscilloscope hooked up to one of the channels. I don't remember which one. And we've got the amplifier. Let's turn it on. And what's going on with the amp is we have an 8 ohm load resistor on each channel and we're measuring across one of them. I don't remember which one. Let's see if we can find out. Is it the right or is it the left? It is the left. So we're measuring across 
the left channel right now and as you can see there's our sine wave we can adjust the output level and we can adjust our volts per division at uh, barely anything we're getting 10 volts um, 31 volts that's pretty high that's about the highest I could measure too because you know, as you can see this is as low as it goes right here and uh, I could lower it and see if we can see the clipping at one point okay right there is clipping actually and hey look at that that actually makes perfect sense because I can have it clip and have the limit lights turn on and off so let's not do that too much 47 volts AC let's throw that into the watts calculator okay so I threw it in here and as you can see 47 volts AC is 276.125 watts that is well within the 200 watts per channel this thing is rated at so I think the next thing to do is take the meter switch it to the other load resistor that is on the right channel and this resistor back here it's not hot per se but it is a little warm so let's now use the right channel and see what happens as we can see we're coming up we will just put it right where the light turns red which is 45 volts okay about 46 so we're different by about one volt but you know up there you're really not going to notice it and when you plug 46 into the calculator it says 264 watts I'd say this thing is very healthy very eager to make someone go deaf so let's uh, wrap this thing up let's get it on the Klipsch KG4s and talk about it but I forgot to uh, set up my microphones right and I got no audio from that so here we are upstairs with a better application for this honestly the uh, Magnapan MG2s it is rocking them it sounds very good you know these Magnapans are known for being power hungry this thing has all the power they could ever need 200 watts but you know as we saw it's actually more like 270 so that's pretty awesome it really doesn't sound that much different than my Carver M200T though so you know, this is much smaller. You see I have this on the floor because if I were to put this on this table, it would probably break the table because this is a cheap IKEA table. But yeah, still very impressed with how this turned out. Very happy with the result. It works fantastic now. It's got brand new filter capacitors, brand new electrolytics all around. Bias has been set. This thing got glued back on. Controls cleaned. And the lights work again. You know, they never worked before. And it's not exactly clear why they didn't work because of everything that happened but you know they're working now so that's it thanks so much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video and if you like this uh, consider subscribing because this is kind of the thing i do on this channel okay i'll see you in the next one